Usually I don't need the mic. Today I have a throat infection, so I've uh, taken the mic. Am I too loud? Am I audible? Okay. Good. Uh, okay, so uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about computational cognitive neuroscience. Uh, it is a non, a very standard discipline. Cognitive neuroscience is a standard discipline. Uh, computational neuroscience is a standard discipline, but the intersection of the two things is something that's just emerging. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have some idea of what this intersection means, right? Of uh, computational cognitive neuroscience. And I also noticed on the website that all the other speakers had given fun titles for their talks, whereas mine looked incredibly boring. So I thought that I'll subtitle it uh, in this fun way, saying where brains, math, and computers meet. And uh, Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and <clears throat> you know, uh, if I haven't uh, uh, sort of convinced you that this is where these three things meet, you should definitely talk to me afterwards. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just also borrowed from a slightly different talk. So. Okay, so this is the human brain. So let me introduce you. How many of you have actually done courses in biology in college? Um, so there's a few of you. How many of you did biology in uh, 12th grade? Okay, some more of you. So the vast majority of you don't have background in biology, it looks like, at least not advanced background, right? So I'll give you a very brief introduction to, you know, the human brain. And also a little bit of an introduction to what makes the human brain tick, right? So what are sort of the core information processing elements in the human brain? So here's some fun facts about our brain. Just to give you, orient you here, this is a side view of your brain. This is the front of the brain, back of the brain, up and down. Many of you may not know that it's just a fist-sized chunk of tissue, right? It's pretty small. It looks very big when you fix it. Uh, when you see the brain outside the body, it looks sort of big, but inside the body, it's actually pretty small. So uh, the sort of the fixing chemicals that you add expand the size of it, whereas inside the head, it's only about the size of your closed fist. Yeah. It takes up only 2% of the body's mass, but consumes 20% of the body's energy demands. Yeah. So clearly something is going on that's uh, disproportionate and it's punching above its own weight, right? So clearly there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, metabolic demand and presumably that's for a good reason. That's why evolution has allowed it to consume so much despite being only 2% of the body's mass. <laughs> it comprises about 100 billion neurons. Right? What are neurons? Those are the elemental computational units or cells inside the brain. Yeah. <clears throat> And it has of the order of, you know, thousands of trillions of connections, right? Very large number of connections between these neurons. Each neuron on average has about 10,000 connections. So that's where we get this number from. It's a very large number, right? We're looking at astronomical numbers here, 100 billion neurons, a quadrillion connections and so forth. It's thought to be the seat of human thought and awareness, right? Everything that we uh, sort of think about in our imagination and everything seems to emerge from the brain. And despite several decades of research, we have no idea how it works. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, has been sort of historically, uh, you know, valid about neuroscience research is that it has been led by biologists. Right? So biologists, electrophysiologists, people who knew how to record the activity of the brain, people who knew how to look at the structure of the brain. Have people heard of uh, Santiago Ramani Cajal? Have some of you heard of him? So he was someone who uh, took sections of the brain, stained them, and he was able to work out very intricate circuits in the brain, how different neurons connect to each other and so forth. Then afterwards, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, physiologists like Hodgkin and Huxley, Torsten and Weasel and so forth, they all stuck in small microelectrodes into the brain and they were able to record activity of the brain, right? They were all primarily biologists and their interests are biologists or biophysicists and their interest was in understanding, you know, how the brain works as a biological organ, right? 
but the brain is much more than a biological organ right it's an information processing uh, entity so if uh, you don't get much of the science of what I'm about to explain later at least I want you to walk away with this idea that it's a really exciting time for new discoveries at the interface of math computing and neuroscience and that's because we are looking at the brain not anymore as a biological organ we are really looking at it in terms of fundamental principles of computing and information processing yeah um, and you know this is a very informal setting so please feel free to stop me anytime and ask questions yeah there's no uh, please don't feel inhibited even if it's a simple question please ask away because i know that many of you you know probably hearing about the brain for the first time so please feel free to stop and ask uh, questions as you like okay so what is what does our lab study we are at the center of neuroscience i also have an affiliate appointment in csa but at the center of neuroscience the primary goal of our lab is to understand how attention works in the brain yeah you have to speak up a little bit connections yeah um i wouldn't say it's difficult to find out in principle it's easy right in principle you can you know there are many ways by which you can say this neuron connects a neuron connects neuron b and so on and so forth but just imagine the scale of the problem right so you're really talking about astronomical numbers you're really talking about uh you know counting sort of the uh the number of stars or something like that right so it's 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 a very you know it's not you know, can you not count stars yes you know one two three yeah but how much will you count right so it's it's that kind of problem it's a problem of practice that is one problem the second problem is neurons are not homogeneous entities right so neurons are not uh, you know first of all neurons of the same class are not even similar to each other but in addition to that there are many thousands of types of neurons and so then you have to first characterize what that neuron is what it does and so forth and then understand how it connects to another neuron and it's just a you know in some sense it's a problem of scale there's just too many different things and too many different types of things to be able to really accurately you know classify and quantify things now the good thing with evolution is that it has preserved this type of structure across many different uh, species right so presumably some of this connectivity that you map out in other animals like mice and so forth will have some bearing on what happens in humans but it turns out that evolution can also play some strange tricks and you know some of the things that happen in uh, you know that you see in mice are not there in humans and vice versa right so even if you invasively take the brain of a mouse and sort of do all this mapping and so forth it turns out that you may not always be able to extend those results in humans and uh, to cut a long story short you can't do this easily in humans because you can't directly take their brains and you know map these connections right that's the tricky part so uh, but i yeah maybe after the talk i'll show you a way to do that in humans non invasively yeah let's see if this this works okay uh so what we study in the lab is this phenomenon of attention like how do you pay attention to one thing and ignore other things right so uh let's see i don't want the attention test to be sort of very practical here right so let, let these people finish and leave and then i'll run the attention test um okay so what i would like for you to do is to um follow along with uh, the narrator of this video yeah No, that's okay. I mean, you know, yeah, no worries. Okay, so read the instructions on the screen and follow along with the narrator. Uh, what the narrator is saying. If you can't hear it, let me know. To test just how much attention the attention-stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals. <laughs> 
We left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention ceiling design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. How many of you actually noticed that the street was changing before your very eyes? Okay, so maybe a few people noticed. For the most part, uh, it's not easy to notice, right? So the majority of the people here looks like missed, they missed, uh, you know, parts of it. And even those who did notice it probably missed some parts of it, right? So this is how the street scene started. And by the time the narrator had finished, the street scene had just, you know, gone all the way to here. And your visual system totally failed to take in these changes. Now, why does this happen, right? You have a very powerful visual system. You can do things that computers can't do, right? Your visual system can recognize characters. It can recognize faces. It's a very powerful computing machine, right? The, uh, the part of the brain that processes visual information. And yet the whole street scene is changing before your eyes and your visual system fails to take cognizance of that. Why is that? So that is basically what attention is, right? In a nutshell, that's what attention is. Attention is the capacity that allows you to process some information at the expense of others. Because you were paying attention to the narrator's narrative, right? And because you were perhaps trying to read off some text here, your visual system just said, hey, maybe, you know, it's highly unlikely that a building's color is going to change in the blink of an eye, right? So you just ignored that information. Even though it's right there in front of your very eyes, this building is you know, changing color from some brown to purple or something, right? It's, it's changing completely. But your visual system said, hey, that's not important, right? I'll process it, but I won't convey the information so that you have access to it, right? So at the end of the movie, the entire scene has changed but your visual system has missed whole parts of it because it has decided that those changes are not important enough to process, yeah? So, what decides what is important to process? That's attention. So that is the capacity that allows you to uh, take cognizance of what is important and to ignore things that are irrelevant. To give you a sort of an everyday example, right? So I'm talking now and hopefully a sort of paying attention to the, uh, you know, the pitch and modulations of my voice, but then a cell phone goes off somewhere, your attention may be briefly diverted towards that sound, but you're not going to constantly be paying attention to the cell phone, right? Then there's a bird chirping outside. Presumably you, you know, filter out those sounds and pay attention to what is going on um, inside this room, right? So that's the capacity for attention. Uh, and as I said, you know, for those of you who come in a little bit late, please feel free to stop me and ask questions because a lot of this material is going to be very new. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's actually not that different. So, you know, in fact, when William James, who was a sort of a, um, you know, philosopher, American philosopher who lived a hundred years ago, he defined attention. He said focalization and concentration are of its essence, right? So those are things that are important for attention. But the idea here is uh, concentration is also about just raw effort, like keeping track of one thing. Attention is about effort, no doubt, but it's also about filtering things that are irrelevant, right? So there are multiple components of attention. And so it's also about, you know, ignoring things that don't matter and why should you do that? 
it's because your brain's information processing capacity is not as as much as you think right it's a uh, um, your um, visual system right it can only see a small amount of information at any time for example like that skoda there right so you can only process a small amount of information you successively scan the scene and build up this illusion that you can see the entire room in all its clarity but you can't so you can actually try to do this by trying to look at this word and if you didn't know what these other words were i mean actually at the distance at which you guys are sitting you will find that you can't read these words right if you look at the word attention it will be very hard to read these words you'd have to infer what they are but your visual system can't actually process that information that's the extent of clarity that your visual system has and then attention sort of directs your vision all around right it tells you to move your eyes look at this thing look at that thing when reading you're sort of continually moving your attention and that builds this illusion that you can see this whole room and it's all its clarity but for example if you looked away and you know you look back and this whole set of blinds had changed you probably failed to notice it because your visual system is not treating that information as relevant right uh, on the other hand if the speaker had changed hopefully you would notice that because your visual system is treating that as relevant right <coughs> so um yeah so that, that in that sense is a little bit different from concentration in the sense that it it also involves taking filtering out irrelevant information which works to your detriment as you can see because if you thought the street scene was irrelevant and so then in a change before your very eyes you could not you know process that information right okay so how does attention work in the brain <clears throat> um again for those of you who showed up late this is a side view of the brain front of the brain back of the brain up and down and at the back of your brain right here is a part called the occipital cortex or visual cortex and the visual cortex is where all the information processing related to vision happens so the skoda that you saw before the color the shape everything that allows you to identify it as a particular type of car all of that's happening here right so that and then the street scene those colors all of that information is being processed here but then there are other parts of the brain right like the prefrontal cortex here and the parietal cortex here the prefrontal cortex is evolutionarily one of the newest parts of the brain uh, lower animals like um, other vertebrates lizards and so forth don't have a prefrontal cortex um the posterior parietal cortex is also in the back of the brain and these parts of the brain are thought to Uh, and then there is another part of the brain called the cingulate cortex which is also sort of in the middle of the brain uh, right so we take this brain and take a section through the middle here, right in the middle here is the cingulate cortex these parts of the brain exert top down control on the visual cortex and tell the visual cortex what to process right what to uh, encode what to filter out and so on and so forth and if your visual cortex were actually processing all of the other information right pertaining to the street and all that in a lot of detail then you would have been able to immediately identify that the street was changing before your eyes right but these other areas of the brain are saying that hey a street scene changing is very very unlikely so just ignore all the other background details just focus on the car because that's what the narrator is speaking about maybe something is going to happen to it right maybe somebody is going to get in and drive it away or something else is going to happen right so then they tell your visual cortex neurons to prioritize and process only relevant informations of the information of interest yeah <clears throat> does that make sense so that's the idea of how we believe attention works in terms of this limited information processing capacity so how do we sort of get to the details of how attention works in the human brain yeah so a lot of this research has been done in animals so but we want to know exactly how attention works in humans it's a non trivial problem because in humans you can't open the head and get access to the brain right because normal human healthy human volunteers won't allow you to do that and there's you know uh, ethical issues as well even for doing this in patients so we have to use what are called non invasive approaches so we have to use approaches that allow us to look at the brain from a distance the functional mri is one such approach where you measure blood flow in the brain as a proxy for neural activity right and this proxy is what allows you to measure where activity in the brain is changing it uses a principle of magnetic resonance 
which means that you can actually measure from sitting from outside the skull, right? You don't have to actually be inside the brain to be making these measurements. You don't have to be physically inside the brain because magnetic fields nicely traverse the skull, cerebrospinal fluid and so forth. Yeah? Similarly, you can measure connectivity in the brain. There are ways of measuring dynamics in the brain with something called electroencephalography. You guys may have heard of this EEG where you put a cap of electrodes and you measure activity at the level of the scalp. Then you can actually also mess with the brain, right? You can actually deliver small pulses of current. You can actually deliver small magnetic pulses to particular parts of the brain, like the parietal cortex. And then you ask, have you disrupted the subject's ability to perform a, an attention task, for example, right? Have you made it harder for them to perform an attention task? Or have you made it, can you make it easier for them to do that uh, change detection task, right? Where the street scene is changing and you pulse the parietal cortex, can you actually make it easier for the subjects to detect that the street scene is changing, yeah? Again, we do all of this in the lab, and there's also a little bit of eye tracking, which is, you know, tracking where the subject is looking, because that's an important component of attention, yeah? <clears throat> But in today's talk, I'm going to be primarily talking about these two techniques, functional MRI and EEG. Uh, most of it will be on fMRI. I'll give you a little flavor of what we're doing on, on EEG as well. Okay, any questions so far, please, again, feel free to interrupt. Yeah. Okay, so the first part is really about, you know, using, applying machine learning, using and uh, applying new techniques in machine learning to discover something about slow processes that happen in the brain. Um, I, um, you know, there's many other things going on in the lab, but I thought of highlighting this because, you know, there's a CSA summer school and you guys are presumably interested in machine learning. Now, how many of you actually know a little bit about machine learning or have used machine learning before? Okay, there's a vast majority of you. So hopefully, you know, most of what I say afterwards will, will make sense, right? And again, feel free to ask me if it doesn't. Okay. So like I said before, uh, conventional measurements of brain activity have always been by taking very small wire microelectrodes, sneaking them up, right up close to neurons, neurons which are, you know, sort of the fundamental computational units in the brain, and then measuring the activity of these neurons, right? That's how conventionally neuroscience research has progressed. For this, you need invasive access, which means that you have to open up the skull. Uh, there's a layer of tissue underneath the skull called the dura. You have to open up all that, and then the brain sits inside that, right? So you have to be able to invasively gain access so generally, this research can only be done in animal models, and that's how most of this research has been done. So this is a little, you know, it's a reasonably good schematic of a neuron. This is an example of a metal microwire. We are talking about scales here or, of, or the order of one micron, right? Very, very small, finer than the tip of a human hair. So you insert this little metal microelectrode, sneak it right close up to the neuron without actually damaging the neuron. And then what you see is you see little pulses like this that the neuron fires. Every time the neuron gets active, it fires a pulse. And this pulse is called an action potential or spike. Yeah. So if I were recording from the visual cortex in the back of the brain, or from a neuron in the visual cortex, and I presented the animal with, an, with a you know, screen like this and asked the animal to fixate here, right? Fixate meaning the animal has to look there. And I presented a little grating stimulus like this, right? A grating is like a vertical set of, you know, not necessarily vertical, but a set of stripy bars, right? Alternate black and white bars. I presented this inside what's called the response field or receptive field of the neuron. Yeah. Then what the neuron would do is it would fire a series of pulses uh, for every presentation of the stimulus. And that set of pulses tells us what the neuron is processing, right? So what are some of the pieces of information we can gather about the neurons information processing? One thing is about space. Neurons don't fire, fire meaning generate these sort of action potentials or spikes for stimuli at any location. They will fire preferentially for only some locations and not for others. These locations are called the response field or receptive field of the neuron. Yeah. So they are sensitive only to stimuli in some parts of space. The other thing that visual cortex neurons care about is orientation. Not all neurons will fire 
to stimuli of all different orientations. This neuron, for example, cares about vertical orientations. It will fire a lot of spikes for vertical orientations, but will not fire spikes for, for example, horizontally oriented gratings. Yeah. So these are things that we can learn about these neurons by doing these metal microelectrode recordings. Um, and a lot of research has indeed been done on these fronts, and we know about processes happening in the brain. So what happens with attention? Um, if the animal is paying attention to the stimulus, right, then you get more spikes, you get more of these action potentials. If the animal is not paying attention to the stimulus, then the number of spikes goes down. Yeah, this is generally what has uh, been observed when uh, we do, you know, microelectrode recordings in, in animal brains. Yeah. Uh, so these are things that we know from uh, conventional neurophysiology. But what time scales of processes are we talking about here? This is work that led to many Nobel Prizes and all, right? So this is like 101. So if you take a, a neuroscience class, this will be the first thing that you'll be introduced to. Hubel and Wiesel, uh, uh, you know, um, all of these other people who um, did pioneering work in neuroscience did work with metal microelectrodes, right? But what time scales of processes are we talking about here? That can it, everybody see this axis? It's about a millisecond. Right? So everything is happening at the time scale of milliseconds. And why should it be really that fast? What is what is going on that's really that fast? Why do you need information processing that at the time scale of milliseconds? When in, a, in real life, right? When would you need time, information processing to happen so fast? Sorry? There is what? There is danger, yes. Um, what kind of danger? Yeah, you please uh, raise your hand and talk because I can't localize based on who's saying what. Yeah, yes. Reflex actions, that's a good example. Like, can you give an example of that? Yes, you don't want your hand to be there for a long time, right? You want to quickly withdraw it so that information processing must happen very fast. It's an interesting example because it does not involve the brain as much, right? So it actually, the whole arc goes through the spinal cord. So you, it, that needs to be so fast that you don't even have the luxury of information reaching all the way up to the brain. Yeah, so that's an extremely fast uh, uh, sort of action. Is there anything else that needs, somebody said danger, so yeah. Sorry? Gaming, yes, yeah. You need to act fast, yeah, you need to respond to stimuli really quickly. Exactly, right? So if you're driving along a road and some suddenly a pedestrian or, you know, uh, an animal, for example, you know, walks straight into the road, you have to apply the brakes immediately, right? So you have to respond really quickly. So all of, for all of these reasons, you really need systems that operate very fast at millisecond time scales. You're walking down, you, uh, uh, you know, you suddenly find that... Uh, uh, you know, somebody is, uh, uh, you know, fallen down or something like that. You have to respond quickly. You can't sort of afford to walk another 10 minutes and then realize, oh, you know, I saw someone, I'm going to come back and help them, right? Uh, you have to, these things have to, res you know, you have to be able to respond at least within seconds, uh, if not within milliseconds, right? So these are reasons why you need all of this information processing to happen really fast. But... The question that we actually decided to ask in our research is, are there processes in the brain that don't happen at this time scale of milliseconds, but that only happen at the extremely slow time scales of seconds, right? Now, is, do you guys have any thoughts about what kinds of processes might happen over very slow time scales in the brain? Yeah. Face recognition, that's also quite fast, actually, because it's an inbuilt capacity. Uh, it's actually pretty fast. It happens within a few hundred milliseconds. Yeah. Memorizing learning, right? That's a slow process. You can't do that quickly. You have to, it takes time for you to memorize and learn things. Anything else? 
problem solving, very cognitive tasks, math, for example. Yeah. Yeah, object recognition is also pretty fast. It's actually something that, you know, uh, you're sort of hardwired to do, as it were. Uh, certain types of object identification are harder. Like if you're trying to resolve two very similar objects, that may take a little while. But to recognize this as a camera or this as a light, that's very, very fast. Right? Okay, anything else? Building new skills is another example of learning, right? It's a new kind, it's a different kind of learning. So all of those things don't happen instantaneously. You can't learn to bike in a second, right? You have it, it's going to take many tries, many falls, you know, many, uh, many days to really learn those skills, right? So we asked the question, is there evidence for these kinds of slow timescale processes in the brain? Yeah. And for this, we have to go to the human brain. And this research was primarily done by uh, uh, Mali and Arshad. Arshad, incidentally, is a graduate student here at CSA. <coughs> Um, so for this, we went to measuring brain activity with functional MRI. As I mentioned, you can't measure brain activity in humans with, with microelectrodes, again, barring very exceptional circumstances. So what is fMRI? fMRI is a technique where you have the subjects lying down inside this. This is a patient bed, right? So you have the subjects lying down here. Their head is inside this magnetic board. And then... You have them, you give them little gizmos with which they can perform attention tasks, right? So you give them a little, uh, uh, you know, like this uh, gaming pad and you project stimuli on a screen that's up here and you can have them perform attention tasks. What type of task? Usually we keep it simple, but it can be anything as sophisticated as the change blindness task that you saw where the subject is trying to detect changes in, you know, full-fledged scenes that are happening inside the scanner. You can also fit them with earphones and have them, you know, listen to uh, stimuli and so forth. And then you get, you know, when you image their brain activity, you get images like this. So as they perform their attention tasks, you get a blood oxygenation level dependent response in parts of the brain that are associated with attention. Yeah. So again, to orient you, this is a side view of the brain, but now I've flipped it. This is the front and this is the back. So you actually see activity in the prefrontal cortex and in the parietal cortex, remember that this is the visual cortex, yeah? So you actually see activity, you can act image activity as subjects are performing these tasks inside the scanner. <coughs> now, the question that we were interested in is, yeah, we can see all this interesting activity. Uh, how do these different brain regions actually talk to each other to control the subject's attention, right? How do they interact? How do they... Uh, uh, exchange information and how do they communicate to control attention does this happen at fast time scales or does this happen at slow time scales and is there meaningful information at slow time scales right that's what we are we set out to ask now why are we harping on slow time scales for functional mri scans the answer is sort of hidden on in uh, the text in the board but let's see if you guys can guess in, with metal microelectrode recordings, everything was happening at millisecond timescales, right? The neurons are firing action potentials at milliseconds. Within a few hundred milliseconds, they had fired like a hundred spikes, right? Whereas now we are... Yes, exactly, right? Did everybody get that? Blood oxygenation level dependent changes by physiological constraints have to happen slowly. Your blood can't rush in and out within a matter of milliseconds, right? It takes seconds for the blood to go in, sort of replenish the areas that, you know, have high metabolic demand, that is areas of high neural activity. And then it takes a while for that response to also decay away. So even though you can't read this axis here, uh, probably, this is starting at zero and goes all the way up to about 10 or 12 seconds. Yeah, so it's a pretty slow response that you see in the brain. And the question is, at this scale, can you measure, uh, you know, informative uh, processes that happen at this very, very slow time scale, right? So for this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we turn to a technique pioneered by Clive Granger. Uh, Clive Granger is uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, and he pioneered this technique called Granger causality. Uh, has anyone heard of Granger causality before? No? Okay, so let, let me get into it in a little bit of detail. 
So the basic definition of Granger causality is, is very straightforward. This is actually directly a quote from Granger. So if you have two time series, right, X and Y, and if the past of Y contains information that helps you forecast the future of X, right, then you say that Y Granger causes X. Yeah. So you can think of these as two stock prices for example right so you have x and y a parent company and a, a sort of a daughter company and if the past of one of those companies say the parent company will help you predict the stock prices of the daughter company tomorrow right so some change that happened in the stock of y is going to help you predict what's going to happen to the stock price of x tomorrow then y granger causes x so this is inferring these sorts of relationships from purely information theoretic principles. The idea being that you only have these time series associated with stock movements and things like this, and you want to infer who's causing whom, who's influencing whom, and so forth, which can, company is influencing the other and all of that. Does this make sense? This is the basic idea. I mean, um, we can get into the equations if anybody is interested, but it's a very simple idea. So. Um, so again, for those of you who are really interested in the math, you model this as a multi, you model these time series associated with X in terms of a multivariate autoregressive model. And what are the components of the model? It contains the uh, time series of X, which is the thing that you want to predict. It contains the time series of Y, which is the thing that you want to test whether Y causes, Granger causes X or not, right? So this is, a, the past of Y, so you are trying to explain the future of X in terms of the past of Y, the past of X itself, and the past of some other control varied time series. Yeah? And then you also do the same modeling without including the past of Y. So the only difference between these two equations is that in this equation, I have removed this term here. Right? Now, once I remove this term, this error is going to increase, right? because presumably this Term will explain some amount of the variance in X's future if it was really informative about X's future, correct? So this is a very simple regression framework and that increase in the amount of error between this regression model and this regression model, that is quantified and that quantification gives us the Granger causality from Y to X. Yeah. Uh, again, this is primarily for people who are interested in the math and I can immediately see a bunch of people yawning. So I'm not going to belabor this, uh, but if you're serious about it, we can, you know, discuss discuss afterwards. Yeah. Okay. There are some assumptions here. Again, I won't get into that in in detail. Uh, there's linearity, there's covariance, stationarity, and so on and so forth. But we won't get into you know that that in detail. But remember that there are assumptions in any model. There are always assumptions. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so then, what can we do with Granger causality? <coughs> What we tried to do is to ask if we can use Granger causality to predict information flow in the brain, right? Now, how do we ask that? We do the exact same thing. We fit this multivariate autoregressive model to time series drawn from two different brain regions, right? And if I can predict the future of this brain region based on the past of this brain region, then I know that information is flowing from here to here. Right? That's the basic idea. It's just conceptually, it's very straightforward, right? Without getting into the math at all. Does that make sense? I can just read this out for you. If you measure fMRI activity from two areas in the brain, and the past of one area can predict the future of another area, let's call them A and B, we say that A Granger causes B. So that's the basic idea. There was a huge controversy when we published this because people asked, is Granger causality really a valid approach for measuring information flow in the brain, right? Uh, there's many, there were many, many papers written on this. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, there was a, uh, a summary which said that, a uh, very influential summary which said that Granger causality uh, is, you know, the application is particularly controversial. Now, why is there a, this controversy? Uh, there are many reasons. The first reason is because functional MRI measurements are noisy, right? You're measuring something indirectly. You're not sneaking right up to the neuron and measuring its activity. You're measuring something that is noisy and an indirect measure of neural activity. We are measuring blood flow, uh, 
and you're measuring it from a distance, right? You're not measuring it directly at the source of the neural activity. But the single most important critique was that, hey, how can you learn anything meaningful about processes in the brain that happen at the time scale of milliseconds with functional MRI where the blood flow processes that are happening are orders of magnitude slower than neural activity, right? Blood flow is really happening at a time scale of seconds. So how can you really learn anything informative about brain function from blood flow, right? This was one of the main reasons for this controversy. <coughs> okay, so um, even up to date, this remains an unresolved controversy because most of the critiques are done based on simulations, right? So they take some neural activity, they simulate it, then they simulate the functional MRI signal from that neural activity and say, hey, you can't infer directed connectivity uh, with uh, Granger causality based on these simulations, right? But how can we actually, you know, what's really needed to do this? How do we get to the ground truth in the brain? There are a couple of different ways, right? One is you can take the human subject, you can put them inside an fMRI scanner and simultaneously measure activity through these metal microelectrodes. You put these electrodes in these areas and then you ask, when I see this Granger causality from region A to region B with fMRI, do I also see a corresponding neural information flow between these two areas, right? That's impossible because, again, as I said, human... Uh, subjects you can't do invasive activity, invasive recordings and it's definitely not going to happen inside an fMRI scanner for practical experimental reasons. You can't do metal recordings inside an fMRI scanner, right? So how do we resolve this controversy? It looks like we don't have access to the ground truth, right? We don't know actually what's going on in the brain to be able to use Granger causality or to validate Granger causality. Now this is where we applied machine learning and this um, uh, sort of really helped us uh, resolve, um, uh, you know, the, the the answer to this question in an interesting way. <coughs> Any questions so far? No? Okay. <coughs> so what do we do with, with machine learning? We have our subjects perform two different tasks inside the scanner, right? Imagine that I'm just going to label them task W and task R. We measure the brain activity from many, many different areas, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so forth, right, as marked out here. We parcelate the brain into many different areas. We measure brain activity and construct these Granger causality matrices, right? So how are these matrices constructed? It's pretty straightforward. Let's say every row corresponds to one of these regions, A, B, C, D, E, F, and so forth, and every column also corresponds to one of these regions. A high value from column at column IJ, at, uh, you know, cell IJ, corresponds to a strong Granger causality from node J to node I, right? So I can quantify my entire Granger causality graph. The entire mate, uh, graph can be sort of represented in this matrix, in this uh, uh, N cross N matrix, where N is the number of regions. Does that make sense? So if I have a connection going from C to E, I put a high value here in this column 3, five, right? And if I don't have a connection, I just put a low value there, right? So I can quantify that. I can quantify this entire graph using this two-dimensional matrix, yeah? So how many features does this independent entries does this matrix have? It has n squared entries, right? So because there are n different regions and each of the n regions may or may not connect to any of the other n regions, yeah? They're strictly not 100% independent because there's a... Uh, uh, you know, there's underlying cert certain underlying dependence, uh, dependencies, but very loosely, let's take it that way, that there are n-squared sort of independent features. And then we train a classifier. Now, how do we train this classifier? We train this classifier in this n-squared dimensional space, yeah, where each uh, dimension of the space corresponds to one of these connections, yeah. And we say, let's say I have 100 subjects on whom I've run these two tasks, W and R, I trained the classifier to distinguish the Granger causality matrices for 99 of those subjects. And let's say A is the optimal hyperplane, right? That distinguishes these two different Granger causality matrices. I take the 100 subjects Granger causality matrix and I ask, can I predict which task that subject is performing based on just looking at the Granger causality matrix alone? 
does that make sense this is classic example of machine learning uh, support vector using you know linear support vector machines and leave one out cross validation right so all i'm doing is i'm using the connections of the granger causality matrix as features training up a linear support vector machine classifier what does the classifier tell me it tells me whether the subject is performing this task or that task and obviously to avoid circularity i train it only on a subset of the data i take the left out data and i ask with those granger causality connectivity matrices alone can i tell which task the subject was performing right which of the two labels uh in the brain activity uh just based on brain activity can i tell which of those two labels uh the data belongs to yeah so I'm, since many of you raised your hand for machine learning I'm, i sped through this part but if it's not clear again please feel free to stop me and ask yeah um sort of clear yeah okay so here's a quick overview of the results so we performed about you know we took data from 1000 scans and 500 subjects subjects are performing one of two different tasks or they were resting right inside the scanner this task is called an n back working memory task it's a little bit of a difficult task to perform now what the subjects have to do here is they are presented with a sequence of letters right so a p f and so so forth uh so whenever they see a letter that appeared two frames before they have to push a key right so that's called the two back working memory task but if they saw a letter that appeared one frame before they should refrain from pushing the key right so if they see this k and k again they shouldn't push the key but they should push a key because at this time because they saw p two frames ago and here they should push a key again because the u occurred two frames ago right so this is called a n back working memory task it's difficult to do because you have to keep track of what you saw several frames ago and sort of ignore temporarily what you saw in the last frame but bring that back to mind when you see the next frame right so it's a difficult task to do and so then what we saw is with this we measured granger causality for both of these different tasks and we found that granger causality matrices alone that connectivity alone was able to distinguish task from this sort of resting state with 80 to 100% accuracy depending on how you uh, trained and tested the classifier right based on various optimizations and so on we did the same thing for a wide range of other tasks and in every single case we found that granger causality could very accurately tell you which task the subject was performing right so that's sort of a non trivial thing right even though we don't have ground truth we're able to say that granger causality as measured with fmri data is sufficient to tell you something about the subject's cognitive state right and that suggests that it's not just all noise that it's actually very informative and it's telling us something about processes that happen in the brain at these very slow time scales of blood flow even though neural activity happens at the time scale of milliseconds right so this hopefully is sort of the um, the beginning of the end of that controversy i mean it's obviously going to take some time before um, it's fully resolved the other really interesting thing that we found is that if you try to look at these causal outflow hubs right what i mean by that is if you have a network like what i showed you before uh let's see yeah so we have this network this node e sends two outgoing connections but receives only one incoming connection right so the net causal outflow out of this node is more than the causal inflow right on the other hand this node b for instance has two incoming connections and only one outgoing connection so this is an inflow hub whereas this is an outflow hub a is not even a hub because it's not receiving connections from too many other nodes right so e is an example of a causal outflow hub where information is going out of of that area so we what we found is that this causal outflow hubs primarily correspond to regions in the frontoparietal cortex again the side view of the brain front and the back right and the anterior cingulate cortex these are areas that i introduced you in to you in the beginning as being important for attention right so these areas seem to be causal outflow hubs across these different tasks and that suggests that perhaps these areas are important for influencing activity in other parts of the brain 
they are sort of the controllers, right? So they decide which parts of the brain process what kind of information. And this was uh, reassuring because even if he had got excellent results with machine learning, but it turned out that, you know, these causal outflow hubs were some area in the motor cortex, right, where which controls hand movements, that would have been a little bit depressing because we know for a fact that the motor cortex is really not controlling our attention or anything like that. So the fact that we were actually able to see attention control regions involved in uh, sort of causal outflow patterns was, was reassuring at the end of this, uh, this analysis. Okay, so let me quickly summarize. Um, so Granger causality we've shown is a viable technique for measuring information flow in the brain and machine learning that we applied with, uh, uh, you know, with Granger causality, it provides evidence for slow time scale processes in the brain. Yeah. Uh, so not everything in your brain really happens at the time scale of milliseconds. So the thing to take away is that there are things that happen very slowly and we can measure those with functional MRI. Yeah. So let me quickly wrap up by giving you a little flavor of what we are doing with EEG now. Yeah. Unless there are any uh, pressing questions with the previous part. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Uh, so there are there are three different measures of Granger causality, right? So. Uh, this one is called instantaneous Granger causality. DGC is what I've been speaking about throughout the presentation. It's directed Granger causality. And FGC is essentially just the sum of these two things, the full Granger causality. So instantaneous Granger causality is whatever uh, instantaneous influences operate between two regions. DGC is the thing that allows you to add a direction to that arrow to say that the information goes from A to B IGC will tell you that information is shared between A and B. It won't tell you which way the direction goes. Okay. Um, so those are just different measures. <coughs> yeah, sorry, I just you know, brushed through that. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is a small uh, peek into what we have been doing with, with brain-computer interfaces uh, to unravel attention mechanisms. Uh, so I'll show you a quick video and then perhaps talk to you uh, a bit about how this video was made. So here the subject is controlling a stimulus on the screen, in this case a rotating grating, you will see, just with the brain potentials recorded with EEG alone, right? So you know some of these things will be clear as I go through a few of the next slides. So as you can see, the subjects is just EEG, the subject is looking at this cross here and he's trying to rotate this inner grating here to align with this outer grating. The outer grating is fixed, but the inner grating rotates as you can see. And the subject's task is to just using these EEG signals, come by controlling his EEG signals to align the inner grating with the outer grating. As you can see, initially the subject is not good, but over trials, the subject slowly learns to do this. Right? And so once that alignment is complete, we just give the subject some score to encourage them. Right? So, um, so obviously, as you can see, it's not an easy task to do. It takes some time for the subject to train up and do, but you know, subjects is able to control things on the screen with their with their EEG, right? So how do we uh, how do we do this, and why is this useful uh, and or sort of uh, interesting? <laughs> so the way we do this is with a technique called electroencephalography or EEG. EEG is a non-invasive technique that, thanks to the way your neurons are arranged within your brain, they are arranged in this nice crystalline columnar organization. You can pick out currents at the level of populations of neurons directly on the surface of the head. So if there's a little electrode stuck on the surface of the head, it can record the synchronous activity of a large population of neurons directly underneath them, right? And this is only thanks to uh, certain geometric properties of the way your neurons are arranged, yeah? Now, this oscillation that you get in the on the surface of the head. This can be measured in humans because it's non-invasive scalp 
measurements. You're just measuring at the level of the head, right? You can then play some tricks. What tricks can you play? You can flicker whatever the subject is seeing on the screen, right? And if you flicker it at a particular frequency, your brain will respond at the same frequency and harmonics of that frequency in the EEG. So if you flicker something at a frequency of 10 hertz, your brain will respond at a frequency of 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 30 hertz, and so forth. So you can record that in the EEG. Yeah, so all you need to do is to present a flickering stimulus. In fact, if you flicker something uh, very fast, faster than what's called the flicker fusion rate, your brain won't respond to those frequencies because it can't resolve them, anything beyond like 60 or 80 hertz. But if you flicker things slowly, like at 10 or 20 hertz, your brain can separate out those individual flashes and it will respond at those frequencies. Right? So then what do we want to do with these uh, 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 flickering measurements in the EEG? These flickering measurements in the EEG are called steady state visually evoked potentials or SSVEPs. Right? So what we want to do is we want to understand mechanisms of attention and using these SSVEPs that subjects produce, right? We want to give that back to subjects as neurofeedback. We want to give them information about how they are modulating their SSVPs and help them train their attention, right? Help them see if they can attend better or not, yeah? Now, why can we do this? It turns out, again, I won't get into this for the, uh, in the interest of time. We can do this because of seminal studies which have shown that if a subject attends to one particular flickering stimulus, the SSVPs become much larger in the EEG. So this is the little black trace is when they are not attending and the dotted trace is when they're attending, right? So it actually becomes very large when they're actually attending to this particular flicker frequency. Um, and we can use this property essentially to say, hey, uh, you know, you have uh, these two stimuli, so I'm going to flicker them at two different frequencies, F1 and F2, and I'm going to record the power spectrum of the EEG, which shows you know, power at these two frequencies. And using a closed loop real-time neurofeedback system, and using you know, some other math that I won't get into for extracting these two different frequencies from the EEG, I can ask the subject to pay more attention to the stimulus flickering at F1 or the stimulus flickering at F2, right? So if the subject's EEG power increases at the F1 frequency, then the subject is correctly paying attention to the one that I you know, want him or her to pay attention to, or vice versa. On other trials, I'll ask the subject to pay attention to the F2 frequency, right? Now, how do you give feedback? How do you tell the subject that they are correctly paying attention? That's where this inner rotating grating comes, right? So if the subject is correctly paying attention to the, that particular frequency, the inner grating starts rotating more and more until it aligns with the outer grating. If the subject is not paying attention to that, it actually relaxes, right? It relaxes back to a null orientation, which makes it even harder for the subject to align it, yeah? So that's, that's, that was the substance of the video that you were seeing here. So the subject is now instructed by this arrow to pay attention to this flickering grating, right? And if the subject pays good attention to this flickering grating, this inner grating is going to align uh, rotate and align with the outer grating. And how much it rotates depends on how well the subject is paying attention. <laughs> so initially the subject failed, they couldn't control the grating. Now, this is after several trials, so you can actually see the uh, arrow pointing this side. So you can see the subject has gotten somewhat better, right? So they're sort of rotating and aligning this grating with the outer grating. So over time, the subjects get better and better at doing this task. And this one of the things that we're exploring is can we actually use this as a way to train their attention, right? Uh, with time, can we make them attend better to one side or the other by giving them neurofeedback? Note that the only thing that they're doing here is paying attention to one of the two gratings and that's sort of deciding how these gratings get aligned, yeah? So uh, let me just leave you with that sort of flavor of things to give you sort of a uh, plug for our lab and this is what we do. We're very interested in these phenomena, the intersection of cognition, computation and behavior. And there's a bunch of different things that we are interested in. Somebody asked about connections between brain areas. This is one technique, diffusion imaging, that allows you to measure connections between brain areas. But what I spoke to you today was functional MRI and EEG. Uh, and, and 
one of our goals, and this partly why I sort of straddle uh, computer science and neuroscience, is to harness the power of theoretical and computational approaches for generating an understanding of brain function, right, and how the brain produces behavior. To that, I'll acknowledge my uh, funding sources and thank the organizers for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so that's a tough question, right? So it's not, not an easy question to answer. The question was really, how is the mind different from the brain, right? Um, the general consensus today, and obviously we can't be too arrogant about this, right? Um, uh, the general consensus today is that, uh, that the mind is more of an emergent construct and that ultimately all you have is these neurons and we just don't understand sort of the relationship between the neurons and the emergence. Um, I mean, emergence is very simply something like uh, how the flow in a particular river happens, even though at the lowest level, it's really atoms and molecules that are interacting with each other, right? But at this, you know, macro scale, you don't actually see those atoms and molecules. You see the flow of the river and the river branches and it's sort of this whirlpools and all of that. But you don't really measure that at, at the atomic scale, right? So the mind is thought to be some sort of emergent property like that. But obviously, there may be principles that we don't know about yet, but, you know, uh, hard to speculate at this point. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's not any easier to study things at the level of the spinal cord. If anything, it's actually harder in humans because it's not easy to image and you can't go invasively. You can't go invasively anywhere, right, into the system. So um, it's very hard to study for that reason. But there's a reason why spinal cord, uh, things may not be happening that slowly. That's because of these reflexes that I think you mentioned. It's just things that happen so fast are hard-coded into the spinal cord that it's uh, tricky to imagine things happening very slowly there for uh, any length of time. But you. You know, if one could image the spinal cord, one could ask that, ask and answer that question. Yep. Stimulus itself. We uh, have a eye tracker, so that's why I actually showed it very, very, very briefly. Uh, that's looking at where the subject size are. Right? So we make sure the subject doesn't move their eyes towards the stimulus. Uh, oh, you'd be generally uh, exclude those trials. Yeah. That's a yeah, very experimentally specific question. How will it dream? I don't know. Uh, it's uh, yeah. So what's a what's a dream, right? Nobody really knows. Uh, it's really thought that it's a reactivation of your sensory representations, right? So without external sensory stimuli, because you have sensory representations in your brain, you can sort of reactivate them. And the purpose of that is thought to be uh, it's thought to be useful for memories, right? Some some aspects of consolidation and so forth. Uh, maintaining strong memories, making sure that they are encoded for longer times. Uh, there's some recent work in Nature by this Deep Mind group about how this sort of replay of memories is useful for artificial agents as well. And if you're interested, I can you know, pass on that reference. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand the question. What was the question? Advertisements, okay. Uh -huh. uh, you can use any technique you want. Anything non-invasive is, is up for, yeah. So there's like very interesting uh, anecdotal things about how they use uh, subliminal priming, right? In movies, how they have 
brief stimuli of products they want you to purchase flashed on the screen even uh, uh, sort of a, at such a rapid pace that you don't even realize that that image has been presented but your brain has registered it right you've not sort of access you don't have conscious access to it but your brain has registered it and so then that there's some sort of anecdotes about how that induces you to go on, go out and then buy these products and all that but it's a lot of it is sort of stories Simultaneous EEG, MRI, yes, that's being done. Yeah, it's part of the some new techniques that are being developed. Yes. Uh, what is consciousness? You have to tell me. You are a conscious entity, right? So can you describe what consciousness is? <laughs> that's the problem. That's the basic problem. It's very hard to define, right? So once things are very hard to define, it becomes very hard to study with science. Uh, things like uh, dreams, consciousness and all this are fa very fascinating, fantastic problems but the moment it becomes hard to define operationally even attention is actually very hard to define operationally right? vision on the other hand is a little bit easier to define audition is easy to define but intent, emotion, attention all these things are operationally hard to define and so they, uh, consciousness is even, even harder right? so people haven't been looking at it very well. It may change in another 50 years, right? who knows, but not, right now nobody is looking at it. And very few people are looking at it uh, in detail. So I, you have to stop me if I'm going over time, right? So it's, you know, you're, you're the timekeeper. So, yeah. Yes, so we actually have some important controls to control for that. So we, what we usually do is we have two different visual stimuli which are identical. One is attended, one is unattended. So then what you do is you do a subtraction. So presumably you subtracted out the visual processing and whatever you see is sort of the modulation by attention. Right? So there's sort of controls that we do. About the size of the brain, um, in terms of what? Okay. Okay. So if you look at it that way, then the uh, elephant or the blue whale must be the most intelligent creature on the planet, right? So that it doesn't work like that. So it turns out that there's a lot to do with neuron density and information processing capacity. So this is one case where I guess size doesn't matter, or whatever. It's, it's really not a uh, uh, you know it's it's the size of neurons actually scales with the size of the brain. Right, so it actually looks, you know, so blue whales, for example, have large neurons. So, um, and mice correspondingly have small neurons, but it doesn't keep growing smaller all the way to the, uh, you know, uh, worms or whatever, right? So there's a certain minimum size that is there. But um, the animals with, you know, smaller numbers of neurons generally tend to have lower cognitive capacities. It does, that is true. Uh, that's also an interesting question. A lot of these questions, right, so maybe this is, I should say this very broadly, right, there's a lot of things in neuroscience where we don't have strong answers, right, and that's part of the excitement of being in neuroscience. You don't know about a lot of, of you don't know a lot about the brain, uh, but you're right. Uh, multilingualism has certain important advantages in terms of cognitive flexibility and things like this. Uh, children who learn a second language versus like children in the U.S. who primarily know only one language, right? There are immigrant children who learn, who both have a native language and learn a second language. Uh, they tend to have certain uh, 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 people who work with children have shown that in terms of flexible problem solving, there's certain advantages that these kids, multilingual kids have, right? Uh, which seems to translate across domains. Like it's like transfer learning, right? You, the set of skills that you pick up in one seems to be relevant to something else. Now, what that has to do in terms of the brain and attention and so forth, 
that's a very open question. It's not very well known exactly what processes are involved. Yeah, it's well well worth researching. But yeah, you should yeah. Um, how do we know it's not causation or, or how do you know it's not correlation? Okay, so a lot of what you can do with functional MRI and EEG is in general correlational. Uh, same actually with microelectrodes, right? In the sense that all you can do is you can say I saw something in the brain and it's correlated with behavior, right? Or I have, I saw some fMRI activity pattern and I can predict behavior. Uh, predict but only in a correlational sense, right? not in a causal sense. Uh, even Granger causality is a uh, information theory based causality matrix, it is not true causality, right? you are not actually perturbing the system and then testing causality. To do that what you can do is I mentioned about six different techniques, right? one of them is transcranial magnetic stimulation. So let us say you have a hypothesis that you have from fMRI, you can perturb the brain and then you can ask does that actually impact behavior in a way that I would predict. And you can literally sort of stop activity transiently in some part of the brain, right? It's heavily reduce it. And you know, those things are FDA approved, you know, it's a, it's well, uh, very safe technology. But it just transiently for something like 10 minutes, it stops your brain from uh, firing in that particular part, right? And then you ask, is that part causally important for doing this task? Right? And so those techniques you can bring to bear. Right now, any, everything that I said does not. Uh, investigate true causality, right? it's all sort of information theory based uh, causality. So, yes, I think we will take some further questions offline.